There's a big difference between $20,000 and $23. $23 is not even paying an electric bill in New York. Welcome back to Wine and Chill. I'm Stephanie, your favorite recovering lawyer, and every month, once a month, we do a student loan update where I discuss my progress towards paying off my six-figure student loans. All right, a few months ago, I think we're going on month six or seven, we started tracking the updates regarding student loan forgiveness as well as the student loan payment pause. So that is always, I would say, one of the most requested segments in this series that has been running on the channel for almost three years. Can you imagine? So if you're new and this is your first one that you're watching, everything is always retroactive. So this will be what I paid in the month of April. So let's get into our agenda. So first, what I paid in April. Second, I started adding a new, you know, what's going on in labor rights essentially segment slowly over the past couple months. So we're going to talk about the WGA strike for a brief second. And then we're going to talk about student loan forgiveness updates. So what's going on with the legislation, with the Supreme Court, etc. And lastly, we are going to do a quick refresher on when the payment pause is ending or the speculation on when it's ending. So that way you're not taken off guard and your bank account is ready. All right, let's get into it. Yeah, here I am. Here we are. Yes, another week. I started paying off my student loans February 14th, 2020 as a self-love gift to myself and honestly and truly because as a former lawyer in tech, I finally made enough money where I could afford to pay them off. And I mean start the process of paying them off. So my starting amount in February of 2020 was $304,680.17 trifling cents, which someone always asks, that is yes, inclusive of $75,000 of predatory interest. Mm-hmm. No, law school didn't cost that much money. It did cost a lot, around like $225. So in April, I paid $500. Ever since the new year started, I've been keeping up with the $500 payments. Student loans, if you have federal student loans, currently they're in pause, so you do not have to pay them. More so, I'm paying them because it's been so long, to be honest, that I've been doing this over three years now, just to keep up the habit, which we're gonna talk about in a second. Because that $500, it was a smidge late. And by late, it's not actually due. I thought May 1st was actually April 30th. So the payment you'll see is actually on May 1st, but we're still going to count it because the thought was there. And so that's technically the first time in the span of three years where I haven't made the exact payment in the month. You should have seen the shock on my face, which I did have half the mind to then save the money instead, but I went ahead and paid it. And I've also already made my May payment. So this is coming out in May. So in May, I technically have two payments. So all right, so my remaining balance is $163,773.97 trifling cents, which brings the estimated total paid in the past three and a half-ish years to $152,294.63 trifling cents. And the reason why it's estimated, we talked about that a few videos ago, is simply because when I was making the minimum payments, that is from a very different bank account that I no longer have. I had to make this Excel spreadsheet, which you're seeing rolling on the screen. As you can see, I also used to make much larger payments when I worked in corporate to track everything. So that is estimated based off of the minimum. I've definitely, most likely, probably paid more than 152 grand. But in the need for transparency, we're rounding down. All right. I do think it's interesting though, if you've been watching this series long enough, that I only have three student loans left. When we started this series, I started at 21 student loans. So, you know, progress is being made steadily but surely. Speaking of progress, <laughs> this is a very hard turn into the next segment. Speaking of progress in labor rights and workers' rights, if you watch TV, I'm sure you are aware that the Writers Guild of America is currently on strike. They began their strike last month and they are essentially on strike for long-term changes to their wages, particularly one of the misnomers about Hollywood writers is they're all being paid a great salary. And unfortunately, that's not true. As we've seen um, from writers from Abbott Elementary, The Bear, highly recommend. Abbott Elementary always gets its flowers as it deserves. It is the funniest show on television as well as Black Lady Sketch Show. Um, the Bear, 
excellent show. One of the writers from The Bear recently did an interview where they stated that not only did they attend an award show where they received an award for how excellent their work was, when they attended the show they couldn't even afford to buy a suit. Their family and friends had to pitch in because that is how little they're being paid. And a large reason why their pay is a lot lower these days is because of the rise of streamers such as Netflix, Amazon Prime, Apple TV, and the streamers are not held to the same standards as the large studios such as Disney in the collective bargaining agreement. So they're currently on strike to change that. So because the initial compensation for being a writer is not all that high, if you look at it in terms of an annualized rate, most writers depend on residuals. So according to Backstage.com, residuals are compensation paid to performers for use of a theatrical motion picture or television program beyond the use covered by initial compensation. So generally, these residuals are paid out quarterly. However, streaming services such as Netflix and Amazon Prime pay significantly less. If I write an episode of television that re-airs over and over and over again, every time that episode re-airs, the content provider generates revenue and a little piece of that revenue gets shared with everyone that contributes to the creation of it. Now, their revenue is made almost exclusively through uh, monthly or annual subscriptions. So there is no re-airing. People can watch what they want, when they want, which means that we're not getting the same residuals that we once would have. What I'm accustomed to as a broadcast writer, as a residual, like $20,000 for an episode of TV, in streaming, I just got a check for the same project for $23. There's a big difference between $20,000 and $23. $23 is not even paying an electric bill in New York. <sighs> So if you'd like to learn more about the WGA strike, I actually did an hour long live stream over on Instagram on it and all Instagram live streams are always saved to Patreon. So you can head over to Patreon. It's available for all tiers if you'd like to check that out. Now, one of the things the writers are also including in their demands is that they want more transparency on how studios plan to use AI. So with the rise of artificial intelligence, which is essentially large language models on steroids, there has been a lot of, I would say, hysteria, concern, confusion. So we recently did on the channel a whole deep dive into large language models, the ethics of AI, etc. So I highly recommend that. In case you missed the video, I'll pin the video link in the comments so you can watch that here on YouTube as well. Also, try saying large language models fast three times. My engineering friends were very proud of the breakdown, so I'm very proud of the work. And with that being said, the video largely delves into the ethics of AI, as well as the legal's Pandora box, that is artificial intelligence, and most importantly, why we should take everything with a grain of salt and caution, and truthfully, not feed into the hysteria, which is, honestly, large language models are yet to take over the world. However, corporations and corporate greed is truly the root of the problem, as usual. Let me know if you've ever participated in a strike. When I was younger, I do remember I had a couple family members that were teachers standing with them during the teacher strike in Miami-Dade. Shout out to the wonderful teachers of Miami-Dade trugging along, fighting against DeSantis. Oof, is rough. And also, if you happen to live in LA, New York, or anywhere that is close to where they are filming, definitely go and support the writers that are currently on the picket line. All right, so on to what you came here for, which is student loan forgiveness updates. It should be noted, and I know those of you that watch this series every time already know this, but there's always new people who sometimes, you know, they're a little bit upset. So I always have to preface this and say, I do not qualify for student loan forgiveness. I'm, as a lawyer that worked in tech for the better part of six years, made too much money which unfortunately after taxes wasn't exactly that much money, but hey, that's neither here nor there. However, I still am a big proponent of student loan forgiveness. Just because I'm suffering doesn't mean other people should have to suffer. And with that, we have been tracking the various legal and legislative battles. So the first one is the Supreme Court of the United States, February 28th, heard the oral arguments for two different student loan challenges. They are still deliberating. My guesstimate was they would release the opinion June, July. And seeing as we're towards the end of May, I think we're looking at June. So we'll get to the effect of what the opinion will have in terms of payments restarting in a second after we cover everything else. And honest and truly, I said this before, I don't have much hope that our very conservative leading Supreme Court is going to uphold student loan forgiveness, but we shall see. 
All right, the second legislative battle that we've been tracking as of last month is SoFi. SoFi is the largest student loan refinancing company in the country. I have refinanced one student loan with SoFi literally weeks before the payment pause started. <sighs> And sadly, SoFi has chosen to be a pain, a pain in the behind greedy corporation and they have sued stating they're losing money from the student loan forbearance and the student loan pause in general and that they want to push everyone back into payment. I don't know how they think that's going to get them business, but okay. That is a regular regular case. Our court system is quite slow. There aren't much updates in that case, so no need to worry about whether that case is going to push you back into repayment. The case to really watch is the SCOTUS case. And then the last one, less litigation and more legislation, which is last month we spoke briefly about the fact that 40 Republican lawmakers in the House of Representatives had introduced language inside of the debt ceiling bill stating that not only did they want to overturn the possibility of student loan forgiveness, they also want the student loan pause to end immediately, payment to start. However, it should be noted that because the Democrats control the Senate, this is highly unlikely to pass in the Senate and therefore it's going to fail. It should be noted that you should know whether or not the people that represent you are actually using the money that you pay them because you pay their salary to do their job. So that is easily available online to see which 40 representatives have decided to go against their constituents' interest. Mm-hmm. Now, all of that to say those three are ongoing, nothing particularly changing as of right now today, May 21st, 2023. But one thing did happen since the last time we spoke about this, which is Secretary Cardoza, the Secretary of Education, stated that yes, this is the final extension for student loan payment pause. It should be noted the Biden administration has said numerous times this is the final extension. However, this time is a little bit different in that the language that they have relied on this entire time has been that we have been in a state of emergency due to the pandemic. And since the Biden administration has declared an end to the pandemic, neither here nor there, we don't have the time right now to discuss whether that's sensible. But since they have declared an end to that, they have basically thrown out the legal grounds on which they based all these extensions. So the original language that was tied to the SCOTUS hearings is applicable to when the payment pause ends. Which as a reminder, since so many different things are going on, essentially the Department of Education stated that payments will resume 60 days after the end of litigation for the SCOTUS lawsuits or 60 days after June 30th. Now, 60 days after the end of the litigation is essentially when the opinion is released. We are guesstimating on when the opinion is going to be released at this point. So June, July, 60 days after June 30th is September. So with that, I think it's safe to say that most likely we're going to get pushed back into repayment September or October may be the latest. With that being said, a lot of people um, thought that student loan pause, which is the payments in general, the forbearance would last through the end of the year. Secretary Cardoza has specifically said it's not going to last through the end of the year and that this is the last one. So I think it's safe to say that the 0% interest, which has helped everyone so much, myself included, is done, is coming to an end, which I have some recommendations for that. With everything going on, the last thing you want on your plate is adding a new bill when we may be in a recession. Listen, inflation is still acting crazy. The cost of grapes are still double digits, $10. I'm never going to get over that. It's always going to irk my spirit that grapes are $10 in New York. <laughs> Grapes! Grapes, mind you, that the produce lately has been very wild. And by wild, I don't mean fresh. I mean as in rotten. Mm-hmm. So I would recommend if you haven't been paying your student loans during the forbearance period, don't worry. Instead, one of the things I've realized having paid off my student loans now three years on this journey is that sometimes it's about the mindset. As woo-woo as that sounds. So I started paying off my student loans in 2020. I graduated from law school, however, in 2016. You see a few years passed. Mm -hmm. The first few years, I didn't make that much money. People will always assume that lawyers in New York make a lot of money. It's not necessarily true. When I first graduated from law school, my first job as a lawyer in entertainment before I switched all the way back into tech, I made $30,000 a year. Yeah, that wasn't going to work. However, in 2019, I made a student loan payoff plan that I would pay off the student loans in five years, wrote it out how everything would look, and I just looked at it. 
and continue to look at it for a whole year to familiarize myself with the plan and to be honest, to maybe get a little bit more comfortable with it. And it wasn't until 2020 that I finally went through all the math and was like, okay, I make enough money. I can pay my rent comfortably. Let us start paying three, four, five thousand $5,000 towards these student loans a month. So with that, the student loan payment pause is likely ending this year. I would say if you haven't looked at your student loan balance in the past three years, take a deep breath, just log in baby steps. Log in, see how much you owe, see what your minimum payment is. The next thing I would do a month later, take that minimum payment and write it into your budget. You don't necessarily have to pay it, but at least seeing like, this is how this will affect my budget. This is how much more money I need to pay this. So that way come September, October, whenever we get pushed back into your payment, it's not a huge shocker to your system because that's not the type of shock you want in your life. Truthfully. And with that, how are y'all feeling? How is your student loan payoff going? There's always one or two people whenever we have these videos that they've paid off their student loans. So I'm hoping that there are a few people that have paid theirs off right now. Um, that always gives me a lot of inspiration. And I'm hoping, you know, as I continue on this content creation journey, that eventually I'll get back to making my lawyer salary so I can go back to making large payments and be done with this, truthfully. I would say in terms of how I'm feeling, because I always like to share them, it's like a roller coaster to be honest. I'm at the first hump in the road, to be honest with content creation. So y'all let me know if next video we should talk about that. Sometimes we do, you know, other topics as well, which this is still a dream job. But a dream job, not everything is dreamy. I'll just put it that way. And so, you know, not making my old salary has been an interesting experience. However, I have yet to touch my emergency fund for myself and for that I'm really proud. So it is still floating everything, everything is still getting paid and my little $500 payments are still clearing. So I'm happy about that. I'm happy about that. On that note, I'll catch you on the next video.